Okay, for our upcoming units, um, one of them was going to be about investigating the concept of containers. So making um, some sort of vessel or container that has an appropriate lid. Um, there's more to constructing and making lids um, in ceramics than one would think. So we're gonna learn about all of those things. Um, but we're also going to shift gears a little bit. And for this unit, I like this to be kind of a research unit. Um, almost all of our other projects, I'm definitely pushing you to, you know, be creative and come up with your own ideas um, to, you know, learn how to work with inspiration, um, but, you know, how to basically have your own design. This one's a little different. I want us to look towards history. Um, I want us to study cultures and um, vessels in history to kind of not only inspire our project, um, but this time we're, we're almost going to do a little bit of um, replicating. Of course, I definitely want your pieces to have your own in ingenuity and your own creativity, um, but I want it to feel ethnic, like the culture you've researched. So we'll talk more about those details, but that's something a little bit different for this unit. Um, so let's go ahead and get into talking about, you know, some of these vessels from history. So I have some examples up here that um, I'm going to share with you just to kind of start getting your brain going and, you know, see exactly what do I mean when I talk about look towards history for inspiration. Okay, we're going to start here with Greece. Um, we have these lovely vessels um, from Greek culture, and uh, they served a lot of different purposes, but um, they were mostly storage containers um, that were made to carry water or oil or grains or even wine. Um, but I think the Grecian style of, you know, surface decoration is extremely significant to their culture. You're always going to have this kind of um, black and orange type of, um, you know, color palette, and they always have some sort of like surface decorations, like the one featured over here. You have this lovely patterning on the neck that goes all the way around it, um, but also you'll have you'll always have figures. And the figures will be, you know, kind of solid, almost silhouette type of figures. You can see down here we have a silhouette of a horse and a human. Um, and then here you have it in reverse in terms of color. That's another thing that's significant to um, Greece, Greece and the way that they would decorate is according to the time period, Sometimes you would see the figures decorated in orange and then the background would be black or vice versa. You would have the figures uh, decorated in black and then the background would be this orange color. Um, also, the shape of Grecian vessels are very, you know, familiar. They're really easy to kind of recognize. Um, they're known for having this traditional S curve. So you can kind of see the profile here. You have this S. So you're going to have a big belly. You're going to have a more narrow neck and then a flared out mouth. But then quite often you're going to see very large kind of looping handles on either side. Um, so that's pretty significant to Greece. And you can be inspired by different parts of this culture. Maybe you're inspired by the color palette and you really want to work with this orange and this deep black. Um, maybe you're super interested in how they um, decorated their surface in terms of working with figures. And maybe you want to create some sort of story or narrative around your vessel with this Grecian style of, you know, drawing silhouette figures. Um, and maybe you also want to include some of their common patterning, which was typical to Greece. Um, or maybe, you know, that's not really it at all. Maybe you are very attracted to this super traditional um, vessel form and you, you know, want to pull inspiration from that. 
Um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, an exact replica. I definitely want to feel like if you, you know, chose Greece and I looked at your vessel, I definitely want to feel like, wow, that looks very Grecian, but I don't necessarily need it to be an exact match. I mean, I, I really prefer it not to be. I want you to put a little bit of yourself in there, um, but to definitely replicate a style. These vessels are from Egypt and they're called canopic jars and they're very interesting. Um, what they are are urns and um, but they specifically held um, different parts of the anatomy for the mummified um, person that had deceased. So if you know anything about mummification and embalming the body, in order to do that, you have to remove the, the organs from inside. So the heart, you know, the liver, kidneys, things like that. During that process, the Egyptians would create these jars that were specifically designed to hold the different organs. And the Egyptians had a lot of um, different gods and goddesses that they believed in. And a lot of their gods and goddesses took on kind of uh, some animal forms. And so these heads of the canopic jars represent their goddess, their gods and goddesses. Um, and so it was, you know, something that then was put in their tomb or in their burial mound along with, you know, the mummified body and, and other precious items. But there's such an interesting story in history that maybe that interests you and, and sparks your interest and in creativity. So the entire head um, is what is the lid. The entire head will come off. Um, so it's, you know, sculpted and something that, you know, locks into the bottom so that, you know, it doesn't just slide off. But they do also come in other variations. These are all different Egyptian canopic jars. Um, so they can take different forms. But again, you know, maybe it's the form that you like, or maybe it's just this Egyptian culture that you want to be able to utilize on the surface, like this um, container right here that has different hieroglyphics that are carved into the surface. You know, maybe that's something that you're really intrigued by and you want to work with. Um, Egyptians worked with a pretty limited color palette. You're going to see a lot of browns and like red browns and yellows, but you're also going to see a lot of black and a lot of um, blue for like turquoise. So again, it could be the color palette that you're drawn to. Um, but the more research that you do, um, the more that you'll feel a connection to the culture that you choose. I've also included some um, Native American inspired pottery. These are food canisters and they're from the Pueblo Indian um, and they're terracotta, which is a different type of clay. It's that brown clay. So they get, you know, these really nice, rich, um, warm earth tones in their pottery. But I wanted to point out specifically that this is not clay. Okay, this right here is a basket. This is a Pueblo woven basket that they would use to store grains in. Um, you do not have to be inspired by a ceramic container from history. You need to look at containers, something that, you know, has a lid and holds something, but it does not have to be made out of clay. So I wanted to point that out to you. And we do have some images coming up that, you know, are different materials as well. But that really kind of opens up the door even a little bit more for you. Um, so again, you know, maybe you are just really in love with the, you know, geographic or the geometric patterns that Native Americans are so well known for. So maybe for you, it's about replicating those colors and those patterns um, that you really want to work with. Um, most Native American pottery is um, very kind of simple in shape and in form. 
um, but then, you know, very decorated with their patterns. Maybe you want to use under glazes to recreate um, colorful patterns like this, or maybe you want to do more carving techniques to duplicate some of their um, tribal patterns. So again, you got to figure out what it is about the pieces in history that you are attracted to and why you choose it and why you want to work with it. Okay, moving across continents, um, looking at some Asian culture here, we have some Chinese vessels from the Zhao Dynasty. And this is from the Shanxi province, um, 500 BC, so um, very, very long time ago. And this is actually made out of metal. So this is bronze. And um, I, you know, it's probably hard to believe that this is a metal um, metal material, but again, you don't have to be inspired by clay. You may really enjoy the look of this, and maybe you really love the surface, this nice green that we get on the surface. This is what happens to, to bronze when it's oxidized, you know, when it's allowed to just kind of sit in the open air, you get this nice green patina. Maybe you love that so much. Well, we can work towards recreating that look in clay. Um, we can just use different types of um, techniques and underglazes to kind of recreate that look. So um, again, almost anything can be mimicked in clay. Okay, so I don't want you to feel limited at all. These were food vessels, um, things that, you know, you needed to keep warm like a bowl of rice or a bowl of soup. Um, and, you know, again, decide what it is. Like I said, maybe it's the surface you love. Maybe it's the, the form, this really rounded, almost orb shape um, with, you know, um, added legs and added handles. Um, another fun thing to think about with um, creating lids and vessels is now you get to investigate the world of knobs. And I know that that doesn't sound, you know, too exciting, but to be honest, that's my favorite part of a vessel because the knob is like the accessory or it's a little piece of adornment that you can add, you know, to your vessel and it could wind up being the most interesting part um, or not. It could just be a functional thing that helps you, you know, take the lid off. Um, but the option is yours of what you want to do with it. So here you can see we have some simple knobs. Um, but here we have little, you know, sculptural forms of, you know, animals. And so again, it, it's up to you, um, you know, what parts you want to make the, the focus and the feature. This slide is showing some wonderful African um, vessels. And this is from the Ashanti tribe. Uh, and these vessels were used to can hold medicine. And a lot of their shamans, um, which another word for shaman would be like a medicine man, they would use these vessels and inside of it they would put, um, you know, natural medicines, like, you know, things that were um, found in the earth and, you know, put them in these containers. And sometimes they were utilized to kind of uh, invoke spirits and, you know, cast spells that they thought were going to help people with, you know, good health and wellness and fortune. Um, but sometimes they were put into these containers and, you know, ground up and then maybe, you know, mixed with some oil and then used as, you know, like a, a cough syrup or a type of medicine that you would actually ingest. Um, but what I love about these African vessels is <clears throat> they're very elaborate in terms of their like carvings and their sculptural features, but their finish is just this really kind of nice, natural, solid black brown finish. You know, one color, um, you know, a solid color, maybe with some slight variations in it, but all of the interest really comes from the sculptures and the carvings. So, you know, that's, again, you get to choose, like, what is becoming your strength? Are you really good at carving and making those types of decorative surfaces? 
Um, or the opposite, you know, are you good at painting and applying, um, you know, different types of patterns and decorations to the surface? I mean, I, I want you to use this to start to figure out what your strength is and what you're good at and how you can continue to push that and develop that. We just talked about, you know, one of the things that you may consider yourself being good at is more painting the surfaces with underglazes. And if you feel that that's you, then this culture might be a good thing for you to investigate. These are from the Italian Renaissance. These are Italian vessels from the 16th century. And they're also medicine jars. They're specifically pharmaceutical jars and they're called albarellos. And they are just like little canvases for you to paint on. They're absolutely stunning and gorgeous. Um, so they're pretty much kind of the same shape. They're more tall and um, narrow and cylindrical in shape with just, you know, simple lids, nothing fancy, not a, um, a knob or anything like that. But then they become these like little rounded canvases for a lot of painterly work. <clears throat> you can look at them as, you know, painting actual um, portraits or pictures or images, or you can use it as a surface just to repeat a pattern. Um, it's very common to see these pharmaceutical jars with actually a label on it, which makes sense to tell you what's inside of the jar. Um, <clears throat> so it could be, you know, a really fun project that allows you to focus more on the surface and the design of the surface. All right, so now that we've kind of covered <clears throat> what it's like to look towards history and to look towards a culture to be our inspiration for this project. Now we need to take a moment and talk about lids. This is new. We've never constructed lids and there are parts to lid that you need to understand so that you can design the right lid for your vessel. So first I'm showing you, this is kind of an anatomy of a lid. This is the language. This is what we call the parts of a lid. The knob is the most obvious. We all know what that is, okay? But then there's these things called flanges <clears throat> and galleries. And you need to be able to know what those functions are. And you need to understand that flanges and galleries can be both on the actual lid or on the container, or both. Um, there's a lot of variations, but you need to understand what those terms are. So a flange, whether it's on the lid or on the container, is, is a piece of clay that kind of acts like the locking system. Basically, it's there to help hold the lid in place, okay? The gallery, Okay, is what the lid will be resting on. Okay, um, you know, you can't have a lid just fitting within the hole, right? It has to actually rest on something so it stays in place. Okay, um, the edge of the um, lid is called the lip. And then the rounded part of the container is usually called the shoulder. Okay. So if you look at this um, teapot I have over here, this is the lip of the lid. The person holding it is holding the knob. Okay. This long piece of clay that comes down below the lid, that is called a flange. That is a flange on the lid. And its purpose is that when you set it down inside the teapot, it kind of locks it into place, okay? Now, if we look at the container part, this part, this ring of clay that sticks up all the way around it, well, that is also a flange, but it's the flange for the container. It's so that when you put the lid down inside the hole, 
This also helps lock it into place, okay? Then this piece of clay on the inside right here, okay, that goes all the way around, that is the gallery. That is where the lip of the lid sits, okay? So I always say the gallery is like the shelf. It acts like the shelf. Now that we've learned those words, you can see from these images that there are so many different types of lids, so many different ways to use a flange, to use a gallery, um, to use a knob, to not use a knob. I mean, it's absolutely endless. And that's why it takes designing, right? So, if we look at this one, number one, what we have here is a knob, okay? We have a flange on the jar. We have a gallery on the jar, but just a lip for the lid. We have no flange on the lid. But here, look at this one, we have a flange right here on the lid, okay? But look at the jar now, look at that. We have no flange on the jar, okay? This one, we have a gallery right here, and that's it, no flanges at all. Um, this tiny little bump might serve as a, as a flange. It will help lock the lid in place, but that's it. You just have a lid, a knob, and a flange on the uh, gallery on the container. Now, sometimes we have lids that fit around, okay? So this thing standing up here on the container, that's the flange, right? We don't need a gallery because the outside of the lid sits right here on the shoulder, okay? And we don't need any sort of flange on this lid either, okay? So if you look at each one of these, you can kind of identify all of these variations. And then here's a few more over here. Okay. So it's gonna be important for you to decide what lid design is best for your container and then how do I construct it? You know, what is the, where's the gallery? Do I need a gallery? How do I lock it into place? How do I make sure it doesn't fall through the hole? How do I make sure it doesn't get knocked off of the container? And that's how you're gonna decide if you're gonna have a gallery, a flange, a flange on the lid, a flange on the container. Those are how you make your decisions. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the directions for the actual assignment. You're gonna design one lidded container that has to be inspired by a lidded container from history. So there is research involved in this project. I want your container to be about seven to 10 inches. Um, we're not going to go too large here. You know, we're not real sure um, what kind of time we have um, for construction purposes. Um, so we're going to just kind of play it safe and design something around seven to 10 inches. You are, of course, going to design and build the appropriate lid for the vessel. It is going to be very important to get all of your points on your sketch. You are going to have to label for me your flange, your gallery, your knob, your lip, your shoulder. Okay, you cannot just draw it for me but I will need labels. And if those labels are not there, you will lose points. So very important. Um, you of course may decorate the surface with any technique that you have learned thus far. So if you wanna use mid-fire glazes or under glazes, but also if you have a specific look you are going for and you don't know how to achieve it, of course, I will definitely advise you on that, okay? And we'll figure something out. Um, you may also use any building method learned thus far. Yes, my friends, that includes throwing on the wheel. Um, now, you don't have the skills yet to throw lids and flanges and all that stuff, but here's what you can do. You may throw your container if you want to throw your container. And then when your container is trimmed and leather hard, 
you may then by hand construct the rest of it. So you may construct the lid by hand, you may construct your flanges and your galleries and all that stuff, okay? Um, this unit, this project definitely requires an essay that reflects the research you have done. So the essay will be about a cultural object from history that has inspired your container it is worth its own 40 points. It is its own assignment. It has to be turned in. It will be posted on your website along with inspiration photos. Like it's, it's worth a lot of points. There will be a rubric posted so that you know exactly what my expectations are for the essay. It must be in your own words. I cannot stress that enough. Number one, I can tell. I know you well enough that if you write something and it's not in your own words, it's really obvious. But secondly, we have technology, okay? And Google can point out any sort of plagiarism very easily. So don't do it, okay? You will not receive any points if you take that route. Um, it has to be in your own words. But again, I will post a rubric for that. Okay. All right. Well, that concludes the instructional part of the unit that you are going to work on while you are e-learning at home. Um, and I will have other things posted for you like rubrics and um, some more details about your um, sketch and how we get everything turned in.